So I'm Michael, I'm one of the neurology registrars, for those who haven't met me. Uh, so I was going to talk about hyperexcitable cranial nerve syndromes. Uh, and you can see this is a nice MRI showing neurovascular compression of the trigeminal nerve on the right, which is a common cause of a common hyperexcitable cranial nerve syndrome. So these are all a group of disorders thought to be drug, driven by this thing called epactic transmission, which I hadn't really come across until I started doing neurology. Um, so this, the principle of this is that there is direct communication between axons. So usually neurons communicate via synapses, um, but in this you get communication between axons, which basically triggers an action potential in an adjacent or nearby axon. A bit of debate as to exactly how this is mediated, whether it's alterations in ion channel expression, movement of ions in the extracellular space, or direct effects of electrical fields generated by a impulse traveling down an axon. But ultimately, the idea is you can see this animation that an action potential comes along and triggers an action potential in the next neuron, which then propagates. Very pleased with that. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, we think that this is more likely to happen um, at these sort of excitable areas, which are often um, described in combination with a neurovascular conflict and um, tumor, so a face of cell tumor or potentially related to previous nerve injury, whether that's inflammatory, infective, and um, demyelination, remyelination, and um, lots of different reasons why there might be an area um, that is more susceptible than others to this phenomenon. And we see this more commonly in the transition between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So going from oligodendrocyte to swan cell myelination seems to make it more likely that this is going to happen. So thinking about the syndromes that we see, so the common ones, the down neuralgia, any facial spasm that I'm not going to talk about in huge detail because I think they deserve more time. Um, but the less common ones, at least came up a lot when I was doing MCQs for the exam. And um, so I think it's worth just knowing about other rarer forms of these disorders. So trophy nerve, you can get superior myokinia, which is when you essentially get episodic oscillopsia or and or diphopia um, associated with torsional nystagmus. So if you see somebody during one of these episodes, They'll have high frequency, low amplitude, torsional nystagmus, and can be induced by down gaze, but sometimes spontaneous. Similar but different and can affect any ocular motor nerve is ocular neuromyotonia, which is when you get um, a sustained sort of tonic contraction of one of the muscles, usually after gaze in that direction. And again, it lasts for a few seconds and spontaneously resolves. The patient will have double vision, and if you examine them during a spell, they'll essentially have a fixed tonic deviation of one eye, which will slowly resolve. And slightly related to trigeminal neuralgia is glossopharyngeal neuralgia. You get similar sort of pain, so sharp stabbing TN type pain, but affecting usually the ear or the throat or the angle of the jaw, can be triggered by coughing, yawning, sneezing, talking. Very rarely, this has been associated with syncope, so because of the connections between the glossopharyngeal and vagal nerve, you sometimes get some vagal um, activation, which causes bradycardia and occasionally syncope. That definitely has come up in an MCQ. Um, and then finally, for the vestibular nerve, there's vestibular paroxysmia. This is when you get brief stereotype episodes of vertigo, and um, it can be rotatory or non-rotatory. As opposed to BPTV, it's often spontaneous, but can also be triggered by head movement. So it can be tricky to differentiate the two. But spontaneous episodes, I think, are what you're looking for here. And again, they'll have nice tagmas during an attack. Occasionally, they can have associated mm -hmm. tinnitus, and rarely tinnitus has been reported in isolation as the only manifestation of this. So generally speaking, in terms of treatment, they tend to be carbamazepine responsive, a bit like pergemin neuralgia. Most of these patients should probably have imaging to make sure there's not a symptomatic lesion of the demyelination tumor, um, and specifically looking for a neurovascular conflict with specific focus imaging for that in refractory cases might be helpful. Carbon bazepine is used as first line, usually small doses, so 200, 400 milligrams a day might be enough. Um, for the painful disorders, higher doses are obviously often needed. Sometimes in watching gabapentin and lecosamide, invariably reported to be helpful in, in case reports. For the motor ones, the so hemifacial spasm and sometimes the ocular motor ones, botulinum toxin can be helpful. And there might be a role for microvascular decompression in some of these, but some of them are so rare, it's very difficult to get any good quality evidence as to whether this is helpful or not. And um, obviously, trigeminal neuralgia is a role, um, but for the others, it's harder to, to demonstrate. So, in summary, um, all of these episodes are brief, usually less than a minute, often frequent, so happening dozens of times per day. 
and they can be triggered by anything that that nerve, the affected nerve would normally do. So either eye movement, yawning, et cetera, depending on what it is. They're probably driven by affected transmission, more likely at a point of neurovascular conflict in that transition zone or any other cause of nerve, nerve injury at that point. And they often respond to carbamazepine. And that's it.